Good morning, everyone. So you're going to spend about two hours with me talking about food safety. And um, um, I'm a relatively new face to the um, conference I started uh, last January. I moved from California. And uh, uh, I think my body is still adjusting to the weather. So. I'm not 100%, so you may see me like drinking some water while I'm talking. And, uh, uh, but you can stop me at any time if you have any question. Okay, so this is a smaller, small enough group. So we have the luxury to um, discuss a little bit. If there is a certain point you feel like, hey, I really don't understand this part, okay? So, to understand the food safety for value-added products, we need to understand why food safety is even something we should talk about, why it is important. And then I'm going to spend about 30 minutes talking about the regulations from small as home-based vendor all the way to the federal level. So what are the things regulators are looking for? And then uh, I will spend another 40 minutes we're going to talk about how we can help you to better comply with those regulations. So let's first talk about why it is important. So you may think about, um, I'm going to turn off the light a little bit, so no worries. So you, you will see this picture is clearer. So um, if you look at what you grow, you feel like I spend a lot of time and those are like my babies. They are clean. What, what are you saying? So there are a lot of pathogens live in the world, like live in nature. So it's not something like on purpose you get, you get things on it. They could live in dirt, they could live in the air. So, every year, foodborne illness, that is food poisoning that caused by bacteria, made 48 million people sick every year just in the United States. And we are considered as one of the, the highest food safety standard country in the world. That translated to one in six Americans are getting sick from foodborne illness. And major pathogens uh, means those bad bacteria. Major pathogens are norovirus. You may hear this on the news all the time, especially when there is a cruise, like cru cruise. Uh, or sometimes schools, because it passes around very fast. Salmonella, another item you hear, from egg all the way nowadays even to flour. Clostridium uh, perfringes, so this is a kind of bacteria really lives in the environment. So it doesn't really produce any toxin until it grows on your food. So usually you hear this uh, um, from like people eat leftovers or there is a church dinner. Uh, people do not hold the food hot enough to prevent the growth. So things will happen. Campylobacter is another bacteria commonly associated with poultry. However, those are the bacteria that make people sick. Bacteria that make most people sick does not mean will make people die. So you may notice that norovirus, usually it, it's very um, um, infectious. However, people rarely die from it. But when it comes to salmonella, then a lot of the times we will hear death cases. So you may see that the pie chart is a little bit different compared to 
how many people get sick versus how many people died. So this gives you an idea. For your production, when you think about it, there are thousands of things you need to consider. Now you need to think about what is the most common pathogens I need to worry about. And in the same time, think about what are the pathogens that could lead to more severe consequences. OK? So whenever you talk, we talk about food safety, you need to think about this. What is most common in the food item I work with? And what is the cause, consequence of this pathogen? So something else um, I want to share with you, which is all of those bacteria on, the, on your uh, left side are bad bacteria, but it doesn't mean that's all you need to worry about, or that is the case for today. Because like us, bacteria are evolving. So based on we, our observation that compared to 2014, we see that compared to um, like the data from 2014 compared with 2011 and 13, that some sort of um, some strains of E. coli has uh, more uh, prevalence in the food area, and some <coughs> strain has a lower prevalence due to many reasons. Might be because people are more aware this is a bad one, so we need to be more careful with this one. E. coli 0157, you hear about this most all the time on the news. Roman lettuce, did you remember last year when you cannot get any Roman lettuce on the shelf? And it, it was caused by E. coli 0157. This is just one of the screen of E. coli. So some non-0157 uh, bump up when 0157 declines. So sometimes we notice that when people take more precaution on the strain, we can definitely lower it down, the prevalence. But in the same time, some other strains, if we overlook it, it will go up. So all of those data I'm sharing here are actually published. Uh, public information, usually on CDC, FDA, or USDA's website. So um, this is another very interesting tool show you how many people, like per 100,000 people, how many people would get sick from certain bacteria. So the top one is Campylobacter. It's the most possible people are getting sick from Campylobacter. And and then E. coli OY57, and then Listeria, and then Salmonella. So basically, in your operation, you need to keep those in mind that maybe I should think about those pathogens when we talk about food safety. So let's stop talking about microbiology. Let's talk about products. So why, again, you showed me those data. You said that so many people will get sick from those bacteria. And now what? So we noticed that the food entrepreneurship is growing and in encouraged by the regulation, by like universities. And then we see a lot of new products. For example, this is, an, uh, this is a picture I took from a grocery store. I don't know whether you can see this picture well in the back. So this is a fresh coconut yogurt. Isn't that interesting? Coconut yogurt. Yes. And it, it, like for a jar like this small, it was sold at $7.99 per jar. 
in a grocery store? Yes. And if you think about what is yogurt again? So yogurt, it traditionally it's a fermented, lightly acid, often flavored food made of milk and milk solids. You have to have certain compounds from the milk to ferment to make yogurt. However, how can you make fresh coconut into yogurt? Right? So what they did was actually they add some probiotics in the yogurt, in the coconut, in the coconut solid, and puree it and then make it acid enough so it tastes like yogurt, but it's not really yogurt. But they can still sell it, right? So the problem here is, if we call it yogurt, what's the consumer's perception first? The second one, more importantly, what I care about is the food safety implications. So during the fermentation, real yogurt making, the bad bacteria will not uh, will be outcompeted by those probiotics, those good bacteria. So we do not have that much of food safety concern. But if they did not have a real fermentation here, then the food safety implication here would be it could have a higher risk of having pathogens still survive there. We don't want to let those outbreaks happen. We want to encourage your entrepreneurship, but at the same time, think about what could happen. So back in 2008 and 9 in the US, salmonella in peanut uh, products for commercial use killed nine and made over 700 people ill. So later on, they noticed that during the roasting process, the roaster has not been well sanitized. One batch of peanuts was contaminated with salmonella, then it's contaminated all the other batches. The second thing is the process. So if the roaster has a higher enough temperature, then salmonella will be killed, right? However, they never validate their roaster temperature is high enough to kill bacteria. That's what happened. And also, um, in England, botulism Maybe nowadays you do not hear botulism outbreak as often. But it could kill people. And then another one is allergen recalls. So we're going to mainly, in this workshop, we're going to mainly focus on the microbial food safety. And we will touch a little bit on allergen um, items because of the limited of time. <coughs> so another example, Ontario, Canada. So this is um, another, um, I would say, hip product made by food entrepreneurs. So this is like maple bacon jam. Uh, and it made over 200 people sick. When we look at this jam, we notice that the pH is 4.3, and the water activity of this jam is over 0 0.9. We're going to talk a little bit more why. So keep a note here, think about why I mentioned so much about pH and AW. AW uh, represents water activity. So we're going to talk more about water activity later. A basic, uh, a 
basic definition of water activity is the water available for bacteria to grow. So um, you may relate these to moisture. They are a little bit different. So moisture is just about how moist, like uh, you feel how moist it tested. But water activity actually counts the water being binded by sugar or salt. So a moist cake could have a low water activity. Let me try again. A moist cake, the cake could be made very moist, but it could have a low water activity due to the high sugar content because all the water are binded by the, by the sugar. It's no longer available for bacteria to use to grow. Right? In the same time, a sauce, think about sauce. It could be moist, it could have a high moisture level, but it could have a very low water activity because all the salt has bind those water molecule, so it's no longer available for bacteria to grow. So we're going to talk a little bit more about wa water activity later, but I just want to give you some um, background. Okay, so why we talk about water activity 0 0.93, which is, usually we say that if your water activity is above 0 0.85, that's another critical value, we would worry about a lot of pathogen grows in your product. Another example, is, which is very re relevant to, uh, to most of you. So there was a botulism um, uh, outbreak back in 2014. They instead bought some um, canned pesto in the farmer's market when he traveled to Napa, California. And what uh, he did this, he bought seven jars and he shared with, when he went back to uh, Ohio, he um, gave those to his daughter and some f uh, mailed some from, gave his, his friends in Colorado. And later on, they noticed that two cases of botulism in Ohio, her daughter and uh, the daughter's friends in their 20s got sick. Later on, the investigation gets into this whole case. Sorry. <coughs> they noticed that there are a, a lot of violation of this product. One of the thing is the pH of the product is 5.3. Water activity is again quite high, 0 0.965. Did you remember our critical value? 0.85, which is much, this is much higher than that. Also, incomplete labeling. They did not have lo lot code, did not have best use date, or tell people, advise consumers how to store it. Later on, uh, California Department, Department of Public Health um, Food Defense uh, Bureau, they found that the, it was produced in a in sanitary conditions at a home kitchen. Okay, so what is botulism? So botulism is um, a disease that is caused by the toxin produced by Clostridium <coughs> botulinum. So, not unlike other bacteria like Salmonella, E. coli, the bacteria Clostridium botulinum 
itself does not make you sick. The bacteria does not make you sick. But when it grows, the toxin it produces will make you sick. The problem here is we need to control the growth of this bacteria, right? So the growth of the bacteria, you do not need to memorize this table, no. Um, but I will share this information with you. So I didn't print um, a lot of the copy, um, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, enough copies of this book, but you can um, just get, get this around, take a look. This can be, um, this is available online. It's the most uh, recent version of FDA's bad bug, bad bug book. So all of those information are uh, free. <coughs> so you can, if you're interested, you can write down the name of the book so you can search online. Okay. So another interesting fact about this bacteria is it grows when there is no oxygen. So does that make you think of anything? Right? This is canned. If you look at this jar, it was canned, right? So botulinum grows very well without oxygen and in a low acid environment. So when the pH is above 4.6, it grows very well. Then, you, if you understand this, you will understand more about our home-based vendor law. We're going to talk more about home-based vendor law a little bit later. But remember, the 4.6 is another critical value you want to keep a note on. OK. So next. Oh, before you leave. Um, please, um, yeah. So this is an evaluation form. If you want to leave this room, it is OK. But please provide some feedback to this workshop so I can improve. OK. So uh, in 2016, there was an um, outbreak of E. coli linked to flour. Is that a surprise? Is that surprising? Yes, it is wheat flour, which made 63 people sick and 17 hospitalized. So E. coli is another common bacteria. And most of them are not bad. Most of them are just living in your gut, in the animal's gut and they are not harmful. But certain strains are, and we call those strains as shigatoxin producing strains. Again, they produce toxins when it grows. Do not feel like, that's why I would say, do not feel something grows in your backyard it should be very clean because bacteria live in this world. They exist everywhere. So contributing factors to most of those E. coli related outbreak are poor GAP, uh, good agricultural practice, inadequate heating, and person to person transmission. So you wouldn't really know how many cases every year due to people do not wash their hands? When they go to the restroom, they do not wash hands. Or they go to the restroom, they wash their hands, but not adequate, did not use soap, or did not wash long enough. 
Another outbreak, um, it may maybe relate to some of you. Um, so this is another artisan small uh, cheese factory. They made soft raw milk cheese. So um, this was ha this happened in 2017. This creamery from New York. Uh, it sells like uh, sells to premium um, stores, um, and the cheese was associated with um, Listeria monocytogenes. So again, this bacteria is also common in milk product and on cows. So that made eight people sick eight hospitalized, and two deaths. So listeria, we will say that um, healthy people tend to have a higher tolerance of listeria. Most of people wouldn't get that sick unless you're pregnant or older, older adults, older, um, so clinically, older adults, yeah, we will say like older than 60 years old, we will say you have, uh, um, you are more susceptible to listerial, um, listeria monocytogenes. And most of the uh, contributing factors, including environmental pathogen spread, equipment, people, and incoming raw materials. So if you go back to this case, the major contributing factors in this case would be they used the raw milk to make this soft cheese. So if you use raw milk, if you make soft cheese, you need to make sure it's pasteurized milk. If you want to make hard cheese, you want to use raw milk, then we say that it has to be hard cheese. It has to be fermented long enough to really outcompete those bad bacteria. But still, as for the regulation, you may have an easier way to make the cheese with pasteurized milk. So the, uh, another related one um, for you, I will also want to showcase Salmonella, which is 2018, we have this pre-cut melon outbreak. It was on the, new, on the news, and unfortunately, actually it was manufactured in Indianapolis, and which made 77 people sick, thir si uh, sick 36 hospitalized. So this is another item that is not allowed to sell per home-based vendor law. Cut fruit, cut melon, pre-cut melons. Because think about this, if you do not control your um, facility well enough and, and the consumers are not going to cook those cut melons, right? Who would could cut watermelons? So it's very high risk for you and for the consumers to eat those pre-cut melons. So again, salmonella. Salmonella, usually the contributing factors for um, past outbreaks associated with cross-contamination, undercooked food, and poor agricultural practices. After we talk so much about uh, bacteria, now you may look at your food system a little bit differently. There is no such thing called no risk, zero risk. Anything has a risk. My colleagues often ask me, how can you eat? How can you go to a restaurant? How can you go to a grocery store? 
So the thing, what I learned was everything is risk-based. You need to think about what are the practices I do can control certain risks to lower the risk. And what are the, what are the risks I should be more cautious, I should take more uh, actions to lower it. So a food system, we use the pear as an example. It has all those intrinsic factors, including water activity, acidity, redox, um, energy source, nutrition inhibitor, uh, natural inhibitors. And also, we have some extrinsic factors, include specifically like storage conditions, temperature control, the atmosphere, relative humidity. So other than those two factors, what can also influence the system would be the process, the process. Is there any heating process to kill bacteria? Is there any process to make the pH lower so bacteria cannot grow? Is there any process to make the water activity low enough bacteria cannot grow? Right? And packaging. Is there any kind of packaging that can reduce bacteria growing? Right? Or certain packaging can promote certain bacteria to grow, like canning. Canning could promote the growth of bacteria like Clostridium botulinum botulinum that do not need oxygen to grow, right? So for the standpoint of food processing here, mainly we can control by using fr processing, we can, what we can control would be water activity and acidity. We will go back to pH. So, the amount and availability of water is very important for your product. It can be manipulated by removing the water, which is lower the moisture level, or binding water with solutes like sugars or salt. So water activity can influence the microbial growth. Usually we say that in your home kitchen or in your uh, facility, you do not need to invest um, $10,000 or $5,000 to buy a water activity meter. That's what I have in my lab. What you can do is you can either uh, pay a small fee for a lab to do that for you. So you know what is your water activity, and you know your process, stick to your process. Then make sure your product is always uh, having, always have the same or similar water activity. So if you look at those food items I listed out, fresh meat or milk or fruit, the water activity is usually higher than 0 0.95. As it goes down, some more processing goes, comes, comes in. Cheese, cheese bread usually 0 0.95, 10% of salt 0 0.93, okay. When it comes to fudge, sauce, 0 0.85. This is the margin for bacteria to grow. So you can see that all growth of pathogenic bacteria uh, growth 
inhibited below 0 0.85. So that's why we say this is a critical value. So now I have a question for you. If you, my product is, has a water activity is lower than 0 0.85, does that mean bacteria cannot grow? Depend on the oxygen content. So you, um, pardon? Depend on the pH. It seems like there's a lot of synteresis that happens with bosses, and so if, even if it's 0.85, you're going to have regions that have more water and regions that maybe have less. Okay, so also based on the area. So this is a tricky question, actually. So. The growth is inhibited does not mean it cannot grow. It just means it grows slower, right? And also, remember, even if you slower the growth, it doesn't mean it's got killed. It's still there, right? So you need to keep those in mind, even if your product has a lower water activity just means that you have a lower risk. It doesn't mean there is no pathogen. You still need to control your process well enough so your product has a lower count initially. Right? For pH, pH is a measure of acidity. So I think a lot of you may um, see similar chart. So seven is neutral. Most of the foods we will say are between um, one and eight, most of the, the food item. The lower the pH, the harder it is for bacteria to grow. So we will say this is um, Pumpkin, so pumpkin, peas, potato, those are like higher pH, or we say low acid food. And fruits, most of the fruits are high acid food, okay? So, Remember this con concept, what is low acid food and what is high acid food. If you can those items, think about canning, if you can those items. So those should be easier to control the bacteria if you can those items. But if you can those, it will be much harder to control the pH, right? So for higher acid food, you need less, less heat to destroy pathogens. For high acid food, you need much more heat to destroy the pathogen. For lower heat, Clostridium botulinum will survive. But the pH is low enough even if it survives, it cannot grow that well to produce toxin. With low acid food, you have to kill the, all the Clostridium botulinum to make sure that it is destroyed because you do not have the extra protection from the low pH with those low acid foods. That is why for high acid food, usually we say you can do water, water bath, but for uh, low acid food, you have to do pressure canning. Remember, 
this is this is a background of your um, class. We are not really saying that um, you should do that in your home kitchen and then sell in the farmer's market. So all of this, what I'm talking here a lot, are the background knowledge to keep let you know why the regulation is like that. It should be pressured canned. It should. And also another thing is uh, when we when we goes further, you should uh, we should also read the local regulation whether this can even be sold yeah. in the farmers market and made in a home kitchen. Yeah. So um, we will discuss that, and that's a very good question. Yes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we're going to talk about this. So uh, acidified, low acid food. So you may have this question. Okay, mushroom is low acid food. What if I put acid in it? Now it's, it's sour enough. The pH is low enough. It could, uh, I could use water canning. Right? Is that possible? So this is, a new, this is another concept, acidified low acid food. So um, this is regulated uh, with, by 21 CFR part 114. You will hear those terms throughout um, this workshop and requires training in better process control school or a certified school. So you need to know this is a much higher requirement if you want to pr process this. It's a much higher uh, requirement than what you can handle in your back kitchen. So some examples. I just want to, uh, just want to give you some examples. What are safe. So this is safe because the water, the pH is low enough and it's naturally ac acidic. It's a red currant sauce. And water activity is lower than, did you remember the critical value? 0.85, yes, it is lower than that. So on the food safety standpoint, as an initial look, this is a lower risk food item. Again, this one. Apple butter, pH 3.6. Okay, apples are naturally acidic food. Water activity 0 0.93. Red flag. This could be some, there could be some problem, but the pH is low, pretty low. And this one, pepper, pH 4.0, water activity 0 0.7. What do you see? The water activity is low enough, right? And the pepper, although it's not naturally acidic, acidified using vinegar and citric acid, uh, acid exempt from pH control program. So the regulation they need to follow is just GMP 110 and 117. Yes. Yes. What is the exempt? Okay, so this is exempt from pH control program. Uh, I would say at this point, um, a, like this kind of product, you still cannot sell as a home-based vendor. No, even if you add acid to it, you you feel like okay, my product has a low enough pH and water activity. So this is still under. Um, I would say is still a no item for home-based vendor, but you can find 
some co-packer to help you pack, if that makes sense to you. Why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what's, the, what's the determination? Yes. So home-based vendor for this, um, we're, we're going to spend some more time talk about the regulation itself. I'm not going to interpret why it happens. I was not involved. <laughs> and um, the reason here is the government, the agency, is trying to protect the consumers. Actually, on the other side, it's also trying to protect you as a producer. Yes, for the liability. A lot of those items they allow you to sell are so-called non-potentially hazardous foods. Non-potentially hazardous foods just means it's lower risk. Even if you make a mess, <laughs> it's potentially still lower risk because like a frozen, uh, frozen bird, like the chicken, frozen chicken, raw chicken, people will not eat it as is. They're going to cook it. So if they get sick, I wouldn't say it's their own fault, but <laughs> yes, but you do not have that high a liability. However, if you produce something like pumpkin butter and can it, right? So let's say, I can guarantee you it's 100% not exempt and no way in a home-based vendor uh, law. If you produce this, produce this, so it is, even if you feel like, okay, the pH is low enough, right? The water activity is low enough. Scientifically, it should be good. But still, think about your process. So what you're going to do, you're going to use pressure canning, right? That's something more a home-based um, approach. It's not really standardized. It cannot be well standardized or standard controlled in the environment. So it's very difficult in that, in that part for even regulators. Can you do that every batch? Your pumpkin you harvest and then you add acid. Can, can you afford to test every batch? your pH, your water activity, test your equipment, test the pressure. So we, so the, however, those manufacturers, bigger manufacturers, co-packers, they can afford to do those items to have a food safety plan. And I'm going to talk a little bit more by the end what we can do. So I will say, Food itself, it has too much to do around food, food science and food safety. So uh, home-based vendor, let's look at as an entry level. So this is what you're going to do. This is, w it has a little box. Think about your playing in this box. If you want to advance, you are going to go to like uh, high school. Then you're going to have high school equipments. You're going to have new things you can do. You can explore a little bit more, but you still cannot explore everything. Then if you go even bigger, you can play more, more items, but think about the investment, whether it can actually pays off, okay? So let's go back. Since everyone is so intrigued about the um, regulation, let's talk about regulation. How about that? So again, on my side, as an extension specialist, <coughs> I'm, I'm not supposed, supposedly to uh, interpret the law, 
But what I'm going to say here are the basic understanding and some science and why we should take care of those. So regulations, how many of you currently sell a value-added product in a fa farmer's market or farm stand? One, two, three, four. Okay, so how many of you are thinking about sell something in the farmer's market? Okay, the rest of you, good. So, now, I, now my question comes is, do you think the regulations for you is complicated? <laughs> yes. Okay. So <coughs> all of this comes from the history. Every regulation, I would say, comes after there is a bad story. A bad story and then a regulation comes. We are pretty, I would say, reactive to those tragedy. I don't know whether you remember 1993 um, Jack in the Box outbreak. That was the first time people noticed that eating hamburger can kill someone. That's the first time E. coli start to be studied in a laboratory, in a lab, right? So before that, no one really take seriously E. coli, hamburger, and kids would die. No, n there's no correlation before that event. And then after that, there are start more and more regulation towards cooking, like towards regu uh, to regulate the restaurants, to regulate the food industry. Unfortunately, our society react like that. Home-based vendor law was passed in 2009 in Indiana. Every state has something similar like this. Some are called like cottage foods, some are called um, as like mm, small like home processor. So this allows food to be made in a home for sale, but it has to be not potentially hazardous, which means lower risk. It, so non-hazardous, it doesn't mean zero risk, it just means lower risk. Remember this. So this is a label. Um, I created, so <laughs> Uh, basically, you need to have the date you make it, and also you, have, you need to have this whole paragraph write down, and also have your farm or your corporation name, your address, ingredients. I don't know how much you know about the uh, ingredient list, so basically, you should have the most, like so, based on weight. So for this, this cookie, I put flour. Most flour, so the most portion are flour, and then it's sugar, and then butter, and then egg. So you need to have a sequence, like, to list it out. <laughs> well, um, basically, I would say, really, you need to consult your um, county. Your county, um, it may vary in this case. And also, it may vary for your um, item you are making. So, but this, is, this would be a good question, very specific question to ask your inspector. County, county, county Department of Health, uh, county level, because uh, we are a home rule state, so um, the best person to contact would be your own county. I have a question. Yes. It seems like the 
seems like um, I haven't I haven't been in the market for a couple of years, but when we first started out, um, I don't know, five six seven years ago, town health department was very involved mm -hmm. in it. And you know, the home based center law was was explained and everything. But it seems like there's a bunch of complete hands off in that. They're not, you know, when you ask them, they'll they'll refuse to see you or they'll refuse to the state chemist office or someplace else. They're absolutely not stepping in to give you any guidance on this at all. So I will leave my card here. So usually I don't do this, but. Um, if you have specific question, you cannot get an answer. Uh, I would be your con I would love to be your contact person from the university to help you connect with someone. Yeah, and uh, if you have a difficulty find your county uh, health educator or well, no, no no like health department um, to give you an answer. Uh, also, you can try um, your county extension office. So ask them to help you connect. Mm -hmm. And usually, eventually, those questions route to me or somehow uh, route, route there. So I would love to share my contact. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I'm sorry, but yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's that's what I what I get from the state level. The state level um, has a hard time to interpret the county. So on, on their end, they have a difficulty because they would not be the person to um, inspect, and then they are afraid that if they say something, and then it's different from your county, then they feel like, they, f they feel like, yeah, yes, yeah, st yeah, stepping on their toes, so, yeah. So, but um, in this case, some specific questions sh still should be held in, in the county level, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but so, no, 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 no. I, I think this is a good point. We can, we can come back and uh, discuss more about um, the regulation. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, if you, you decide to leave this room, uh, I would really appreciate you fill out this uh, evaluation form. So, you do not need to write your name. I'm not going to take uh, like uh, take any personal information. I just want to know what you think, and uh, if you have any comment, what are the things you want to learn more? You can write down on the bottom. So we will continue talk about this after the break. We will come back at ten o'clock. <laughs>